You guys can see this? Yes. Awesome. So last week, we, we kind of explored the power of using things like curiosity and riddles and paradox in sales copy, right? We found, like, a, we were just talking about, like, the general power of using that kind of stuff. And now this week, I want to do, dive a little deeper and show people how to actually apply that into sales copy. Hey, Mario, can you zoom like in a, a little bit? What's up? Can you zoom in just a little bit? Oh, yeah, hold up. Zoom in. How's that? Good. All right, cool. So I wanted to walk through a few real examples of people actually who used curiosity and these riddle questions in their sales copy that actually did a great job with it. And the good thing about that is some people actually did it like this last week, which is great, which shows that it's not that hard to do. But then like you can see like some really successful uh, promos and emails and stuff like that. Use, use this as well. So it's not just like theory that we're saying this might work. We know it fucking works. So let's just figure out why it works now. And I know Randall, Randall's here, right? We know his testosterone, uh, his testosterone quiz, quiz lead fucking ended up crushing for years. So if you haven't seen that one yet, I'll just break that one down for you real quick so you can see why and why I think it was probably so successful. So we're not going to go uh, too deep in it, but just the, ent the intro is pretty important. And I think there's certain reasons why it worked. Can you guess which one of these foods is killing your testosterone? Is it eggs, flaxseed, milk, bananas, asparagus, oatmeal, or chicken? I'll give you the answer in just a few minutes and you will be shocked. Plus, I'm also going to reveal three more testosterone killing foods that you're probably eating right now, thinking that are good for you, when in reality, they're destroying your manhood. So does anybody know, have any ideas as to why this lead has worked as well as it did? I, I think it's just a really good reason to keep watching because if they, they don't know what it is, then they're potentially going to keep destroying the testosterone. Right. Curiosity driven. Yep. It's, it definitely makes you curious. But there's a little bit more about that. I think there's also an element of like shame. Like every guy wants to be like the manliest guy. And if you're doing yeah. something to intentionally shame tamp is, down your own manhood. Shame is part of it, yeah. destroying the manhood. So they make he makes the problem directly relevant to his prospect, right? Like this is not something like how to save uh, like 20 bucks on your car insurance. You don't really give a shit, right? This is something that's actually affecting your life that you want to know the answer if you're, if you're uh, suffering from testosterone issues. But the other thing is that the answer to the question is not really that uh, exactly, Mary. The answer to the question is not immediately obvious. Like these are guys who are probably dealing with testosterone issues. They were on the V-shred list or click the V-shred ad. So they're probably at least somewhat interested in their health and their fitness. So all these foods that he listed, it's not like he didn't list like eggs, flaxseed, Doritos. Pretty much everything he, every food, every option he gave them here is something that like reasonable people could have as part of what they think is a healthy diet. But the answer is not as obvious. Like, I think that's what makes you like, like the people watch the people watching this video probably eating eggs, might be eating flaxseed, probably drinking milk or asparagus or oatmeal or chicken. So it's not just the fact that like these foods are screwing with other guys' testosterone levels. If you're eating any one of these seven foods, you have to watch the rest of the video because you know that you're getting directly affected by it. And uh, Randall, since you're here, you have any other? Uh, oh, I can't be sleeping. <laughs> no, I'm here. I know. No, you know that, that's exactly any other what thoughts I did. That you I, think I, as the I, I listened, well, you picked it up. I listed those foods specifically because they're foods that guys that are trying to eat healthy typically will eat, right? So um, that was, I think, a big factor for why it worked so well. I think for sure. I think it was brilliant. Yeah. Well, thank you. But now, let's look at another testosterone lead that I wrote which was actually slightly beating the other lead in testing, but we stopped it because we had like a million other things to test. And Randall's numbers were so good that it wasn't even worth us. Like we had a million other things that were bigger priority than like coming up with new ads for this. So check out this lead for a testosterone offer, the same testosterone offer. Yes, the very, 
Both of these leads I'm showing you are the very beginning of the VSL. Like this is exactly how they start. Here we go. So it starts with, these are not, uh, I couldn't find the actual video, so I just picked random pictures, but it was pictures like this. And then this picture on the right was a little bit like, the photo itself was aged a little bit. So it doesn't look like super high quality, but same kind of guy, same idea. And you'll see why that's important in a second. So which of these two men do you think has higher testosterone levels? Well, before you make your guess, let me give you a little background on these guys to see if it changes your answer. Our example, Steve here on the left, represents your average 25-year-old. He's been working an office job for the last three years. He hits the gym regularly, and he likes to go out drinking with his boys on the weekend. Grandpa Jim here on the right represents your average 65-year-old. He's recently retired and likes to go fishing or golfing a few times a week. His wife always hounds him about exercising to keep his heart healthy, so he'll hop on the bike every now and then just to shut her up, then probably fire up a smoke right after, which has been a habit of his for over 40 years. As you can see, there's nothing particularly special about either of these guys, which is why we chose them as examples. So who do you think has the higher testosterone levels? Is it Steve, who's 25, or Grandpa Jim, who's 65? So the way this is set up, I mean, most logical people are going to obviously think that the 65-year-old is, I mean, the 25-year-old has the higher testosterone, right? He exercises more, he's younger, probably eats healthier. So like... I mean, marketers, you guys might know what I'm doing here. Exactly. You, you marketers might know what I'm doing here because it's obviously there's no reason for the VSL if the guy on the left is winning. But we can all agree, right, that logically the guy on the left should win. Right? Let me know if you agree with that. That makes sense. All right, cool. So who do you think has the higher testosterone levels? Is it Steve, who's 25, or Grandpa Jim, who's 65? Now, most people think Steve is the obvious the obvious answer, which I wanted to confirm their suspicions right away. So if they think like, of course, it's the guy on the left, I don't want them to stop watching there thinking that that's supposed to be some big surprise. I mean, surely a 25-year-old has more testosterone than a 65-year-old. That's what we're told. But before you lock in that guess, what if I told you that the picture of Steve was taken in 2020 and that picture of Grandpa Jim was taken in 2006? Would that change your opinion? So now it's creating more curiosity. Like why would the year that the picture is taken actually affect a guy's testosterone, right? The guy's still 65 years old in the picture. The guy's still 25 years old in his picture. Shouldn't change anything. Agreed? But here's why, here's why it changes a lot, everything. Well, it turns out it probably should change your opinion because multiple studies have shown that average testosterone levels have tanked in the last 15 years. In fact, there was a recent study published in the Journal of Reproductive Biology and Endocrinology, which analyzed blood samples of over 100,000 men. And in this study, they showed that the average 20-year-old tested today has similar testosterone levels to what a 70-year-old had in 2006. And this sharp decline in testosterone levels is affecting men in all age groups. Because despite what we've been told, your testosterone levels aren't only determined by how old you are. A recent study from the University of Sydney all but confirms this. There's something else going on, which is draining the testosterone levels of all men in all age groups, stealing our strength, stamina, energy, and sex drives, and turning millions of us into fatter, weaker, softer shells of the men we're supposed to be. And now you've got to think that. So now we're telling, giving them, we're telling them there's a big problem that everybody's facing, but it's not just older guys who are facing the problem, which is good because it makes the offer appeal to all guys. But we're not stupid either. We know that most guys watching this who are specifically looking out, looking for solutions to their testosterone problems are probably going to be on the older side. So if you make that older guy win, obviously it gives them like that renewed hope and even more intensified curiosity that, oh shit, maybe my situation itself isn't really hopeless and there's something I can do to fix that. So if you've been feeling off or past your prime, if your energy levels aren't where they should be, if you've been struggling to burn fat or build muscle or perform the way you should at work, in the gym, or in the bedroom, there's a good chance you've been assaulted, you've been getting assaulted by this silent testosterone killer. So it's not just your age that's causing your problem. It's this thing that's affecting everybody. And the reason I made this video is to help you fight back. In the next few minutes, I'm going to share everything you need to know to help save your testosterone and restore your masculinity before it's stolen from you. I'm going to tell you about the shocking event which contributed to today's ongoing testosterone crisis, plus how some of the world's most powerful corporations on the planet 
are amplifying today's test dream. So now you have like a little hint of conspiracy angle, which makes even more, even more curiosity. I'm also going to reveal why your testosterone levels don't tell the entire story and what you should focus on instead if you want to help restore your masculinity and become lean, strong, and always ready for action. I'm going to tell you about the sneaky testosterone killer hidden in our food, our air, and our water supply, which is so devastating. A recent study has shown it can literally turn male frogs into functional females. This is something we're being exposed to every single day, and I'm going to show you how you can help com combat its effects on your testosterone. Finally, I'm going to let you in on a simple science-based secret that's already helped over 100,000 men to maximize their body's natural testosterone production. The best part is this simple testosterone bo boosting ritual takes just 30 seconds a day and gives your body the support it needs to safely crank up your natural testosterone production again. So you can look, feel, and perform like the man you want to be, even though the chemical deck has been stacked against us. This is life-changing stuff, and I'm going to share all of it with you in just a few minutes. But before we dive in, first I need to quickly tell you who I am and how I discovered these secrets in the first place. So yeah, I just wanted to go through the whole lead to show you how I started with that like quizzical, uh, I wrote this one. So I just wanted to, and honestly, like it was running neck and neck with Randall's control, which was great. It pulled ahead a little bit and then we shut it down in testing, but I can't even take, I can't even take like all the credit for it at all because the only reason why I decided to go with a quiz lead was because I saw Randall's that was fucking crushing and is still crushing to this day. So I figured, why don't we just get them more uh, variants of this quiz, like quizzical curiosity based lead to test we already have one that's smashing it. And obviously it's resonating with this market. So, and I wanted to go through the whole lead to show you how I started with that, started, started with that basic lead of that, getting that like question that's somewhat direct, uh, somewhat related to people. And then really, as we're answering the question, which has like counterintuitive answers, make sure that all the solution to that is directly relatable to the people we're talking to to where it starts at the, as this simple quiz where people think they're just playing this game of like, a, like playing a game, a fun game. Meanwhile, it's relating you to the people in the game and talking about how the problem that's affecting them is affecting you and we have the solution, which is really important. So those are two leads that I wanted to get into, into wanted to get into just to show you how curiosity can directly apply to uh, sales layers. Now, Another thing I wanted to walk through is that it's not just your sales letter. You don't have to write this big complicated lead to take advantage of this effect. And I know on last week's call, we were talking about how this can apply to ads. And I gave out like a basic idea, just riffing off. I riffed on a basic idea of how to apply this to solar ads because I know, because we actually have a client who's, who we write solar ads for as part of CA Labs every week. So then Ryan Connolly, who I think is on this call too, right? He took that idea and turned it into, he turned it into a solar ad right away. So let me show you how he took that idea, like that basic idea and turned it into an actual ad that were, is actually being tested like this week. And I think it's probably gonna do well. So it starts with an image of two homes side by side, one has power and one without power. Can you guess which one of these two homes doesn't pay their electric bills? You think it's the one with the power cut off, right? Well, guess again. Believe it or not, the home with power hasn't paid an electric bill in months that they always have power even during the worst of storms, while their neighbors are left in the dark during blackouts and still pay higher electric bills than ever before. How is this possible? Believe it or not, the family with power took advantage of this new $369 billion clause in the Inflation Reduction Act, where the US government gave them a brand new state-of-the-art solar system and a Tesla power wall at zero net cost. And the good news is, there's still spots available for Americans living in one of the 11 states selected, which means if you qualify today, not only will you get the latest generation of solar panels and a Tesla power wall for zero net cost, but you'll also get a few thousand dollars in tax credits from our government with no questions asked, just for saying yes to this no-brainer offer. Crazy, right? So while your neighbors are paying inflated electric bills this winter and worrying about blackouts, you could be powering your home through even the toughest of storms without paying a dime. The only catch is there's only a select number of spots left and they're filling up fast, so don't wait. Just hit the button below this video and take 60 seconds to answer a few quick questions to see if your home qualifies. So it's not like the most complicated thing in the world, right? It took the basic riddle that we talked about last week, why certain homes pay more money for, why certain homes who use their electricity less 
actually end up paying more for their electric bills than some people who are able to run their electricity all the time. And if you're watching this ad and you're somebody who's watched your electricity go up, obviously you're going to want to know the answer to that. And then it's just like, it's a tangible benefit, right? You have these, you don't want to pay, nobody wants to pay all this money for electricity. And now we're telling you that the chain, the, the solution to lowering your electric bill is such an irresistible offer because it's not like, we're not telling you, yeah, of course the guy on the right is running his electricity and, and paying less on his electric just because he's, he switched to solar. So switch to solar. No, it's, Yes, solar will help you save money on your electric bill, but the U.S. government wants to give you a free solar system for free. So it's curiosity, tangible benefit, and an irresistible offer that, like, honestly sounds too good to be true. The fact that you can save money on electricity and protect your home from blackouts without having to pay any money because the government's going to come in and set this up for you for free. And then also sticking to solar, just to show you that it's not really the writing that makes this stuff work. It's the idea. Taking the idea and running with it is pretty simple. Once you get the idea and know, have that basic idea that you know is going to spark curiosity. So Mattia, who's also in CA Pro and has been writing, uh, and been writing ads for a solar client, he wrote this ad, which is also high curiosity based, which I love. So he's going to put this big mansion picture. The ad starts with a picture of this mansion and this standard home. Beverly Hills Mansion or this little single family house? Which one do you think has a higher electricity bill? Well, here's a hint. A single family house is just over a thousand square feet and they don't use much electricity. On the other hand, that Beverly Hills Mansion is over 10,000 square feet and uses more electricity than 10 average homes combined. So which, do you, which one do you think has a higher electricity bill? I mean, this is, again, this is very logical. Obviously this house, if they're running, running throwing all these crazy parties and running all running their electricity in way more rooms than this house even has, you're gonna think the mansion has higher electric bills. So which one do you think has a higher electricity bill? I take a guess and say you're picking the mansion, right? Well, if that's the case, <laughs> you're dead wrong. You see last month, the owner of that mansion paid just $10 for the power he consumed. Well, that little single family house paid over $300. So how's that possible? Well, it's all thanks to this new solar program our government recently released. And then the other lead he wrote is, how come this massive Beverly Hills mansion is paying just $10 a month for electricity while this single thousand square foot house is paying hundreds and hundreds of dollars every single month for the power they consume, despite using five times less energy than the mansion owner? So just different ways to set up that same thing. Yeah, I know. I don't think Mattia knows. Uh, he's a good writer, but he's young. And I don't know if he's, I don't know if he's really up to date with uh, American housing prices, but uh, but it doesn't matter. The copy itself is good. The riddle is curiosity inducing. I'm dying to see how it's gonna work. And you can see it's all different variations. It's all the same shit, right? It doesn't matter how he phrased it. It's just creating that like simple idea, that simple idea that big ass house, doesn't matter how much the house is for all you sticklers, runs way more electricity than little house, but their electri electricity bills is way higher. So that's the juxtaposition we need to make these ads work. And I think he did a good job of that. I think Ryan did a good job of that. And I'm probably gonna write a couple of ads of this to try to beat both of them. So we'll see how that one goes too. All right. So, um, yo. That was solid. Um, so one thing that that's cool too is looking at these is like, all right, we have the examples, but what is the, what's like the, the principle or what's the, the algorithm behind it, right? It able, so how do we generate these? Right. So one thing that you'll notice, um, there's at least two patterns that you can pick up on these, which makes it really easy to apply to anything you do. Because I find in my experience, like, especially for the, the VSL copywriters of which I think, you know, there's a lot of us in here who write long form stuff. A lot of times it's coming up with like the opening and the lead which is the biggest part. And that also has the biggest difference. So nailing that part is key. And what's cool about this is this gives you like one more tool in your tool belt to knock something out. So let's look at like, what is the, the underlying pattern behind these? Well, everybody has in their mind, they have, um, they have good and bad references for things. So for example, um, when it comes to food, we have good and bad references. 
right? Yeah, so juxtaposition is, is obvious. So everyone already, the market is always going to have like good, good and bad uh, references. So what you do is you just play on that psychology. I'm going to put this in chat and I'll explain what I mean. Yep. So the riddle is basically which good thing could actually be bad or which bad thing could actually be good, right? So if you look at Randall's lead, for instance, it's like which one of these good healthy foods could actually be bad for you, right? Um, and vice versa. And it, it seems like pretty basic, but you can apply this to, like, I'm pretty sure you can apply this to almost anything. Like anyone could throw out a, a market and I, I bet you could uh, apply this to that. Yep. yep. So like, you know, if you're doing a fitness thing, which good thing could actually be good for you? You just think about, um, you know, very simply it's like, oh, you know, here's why cardio is messing you up. Here's why intermittent fasting is messing you up. Here's why keto could actually be bad for you. Um, and then vice versa, what's the bad thing? Here's why Here's why sugar is the number one thing you need in order to smell food. Right. Here's why, you know, eating eating more is actually the key to doing whatever. All of these things create a lot of, uh, a lot of curiosity. The other thing too, is if you look at the actual riddle ad, is what's the difference between these, these two things, right? So what's the difference between these two, these two men, right? You see an old man and you see a young man. So instantly in our minds, we're already, we're already gonna put the labels or the market's gonna put the labels of old man, low testosterone, young man, high testosterone. Yeah. And then what you're doing is you're saying one is secretly um, suffering and it has to be unexpected, right? So for example, there's a silent testosterone killer, which actually is making your, um, is actually making your assumptions about the world wrong. And that's what creates a lot of the curiosity is like, people want to have a stable model and a stable uh, representation of the world. So when you mess that up by creating one of these paradoxes and riddles, they have to answer the question. They have to figure out what the solution is. Um, and so that's why they have to keep watching. They have to satisfy that curiosity. Otherwise they're going to be walking around not knowing what's going on. But you can also reverse that by saying, you know, one is secretly benefiting. So for example, look at the house, the house example. Here's two houses, right? One of them is really, really big, right? So it should use more electricity. And then what you're, so you already have your model of the world. Of this one is using more electricity. This one is using less. But then you're saying, nope, that's actually wrong because one of these is secretly benefiting. Right. Um, so you can use this. Uh, I'm sure there's other ways to like generate these riddles, but yep. uh, literally you can take any market or any piece of copy that you have and you can run through. And now you have four different openings that, you can test, you can use ads. Um, so this is pretty generative. I don't know, is this, is that interesting or useful? Or yeah, sense? Sure. I have a few other little tips later on that I uh, get to for generating these as well. Okay, oh, nice. And good bet is one of them. So thanks for fucking spoiling it. No, I'm just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Perfect. But uh, yeah, that was good. That was a good explanation. That makes sense too. And I think another thing why these riddles like actually work, even if the, like none of these riddles were really like that groundbreaking, right? We're not really like, no one's gonna be like, oh, wow, that's so amazing when they do this. But it's just, it's engaging enough. And it's like, it's occupying people's minds at a level to where they're not, it's delaying skepticism on your message. Like you're not just coming out and like making a direct promise that people are gonna call bullshit on right away. It starts so innocent. We're just asking like a riddle. Now you're getting them engaged. Like where you're, where you're the messages that you're actually trying to get through are like slipping underneath that critical factor. So it gives you more reason to like identify with your audience and make the promises that you're trying to make because you're not trying to sell them. You're not being that salesman guy. You're just telling them like people are going to think it's going to be this, but it's not. And here's why. So you're like, at that point, you're just giving them that answer to the riddle that they want now at this point. And you're, the answer to the riddle just happens to also set up the product that you want to sell them. just comes across as like less salesy and like more of like doing them a favor. So now let's look at an email. Gundry, curiosity, curiosity click email. We've seen a millions of variations of these. They keep running it over and over because the things just fucking work, right? So dear friend, what if I said a good portion of your weight gain, brain fog, and digestive issues may stem from a single vegetable you eat? Listen, I realize this sounds far-fetched, but the science is groundbreaking. 
In fact, we now know of at least one so-called health food that could be wreaking havoc on your insides and your results. What's worse, it's probably in your kitchen right now. And today, my good friend and colleague, Dr. Stephen Gundry, is pulling back the curtain on exactly what it is. This vegetable could be the number one danger in your diet. Very basic email that they run on email drops and stuff like that all the time because it works well with like colder audiences. Why do you guys think this works? Anybody have guesses? Yes. We all assume all veggies are good. The fear that they're going to eat it. That's true. Curiosity, yep. Any others? Credibility from the doctor, yep. Paradoxical. Yes, Randall, that's a really good point. And everybody eats vegetables because they know that they're, they're told, they don't know, they're told that they're good for you, right? There aren't that many people out here who are out like eating vegetables because they have this amazing affinity for vegetables. Like, oh, I fucking love my tomato or whatever, right? You're not doing it because you love it. So not only are you promising to, not only are you promising to remove a problem that's causing like their weight gain or brain fog, but getting rid of their problem is something they, getting rid of this problem is probably something they want to do anyway. This is like, the way I wrote it is that there's a low barrier to getting results. They're not telling you you have to change your diet or give up your burgers, beer, or your ice cream, or your wine, or your chocolate, or your Doritos, or shit that people actually want to eat, right? They're telling you that you can get all these amazing results by removing a vegetable that you probably don't fucking want to eat anyway. So it's like good news. They're promising you like good news that's also going to give you the results that you want. Like, all right, yeah, you're 50 pounds overweight. Don't worry about the pizza. Just stop eating cucumbers at six o'clock. You know what I mean? It's like an implied promise of amazing result from something that's so easy for you to implement in your life. So like the vehicle that's giving them the results is something that they want. This is a benefit for you. You're going to, all you got to do is stop doing this thing you don't want to do anyway, and you're going to get amazing results for that, from that. And you can see, like, it, it, these benefits are so general that it can literally apply to anything. What is, like, what is the healthy food that's causing your cavities and yellow teeth? Or what is the one line that, a man says to a woman that makes her reject you and never want to talk to you again, or the same way, a woman to a man. Like, it's just a simple thing that you could remove from your life that gives you the results you want. And if you make it something that people are already doing, like they, if there's a chance that they think they're already making that mistake, they're definitely going to have the curiosity to at least click through and find out what the answer is. Even if they want to end up calling bullshit later, you tell me I'm eating a vegetable that's making me fat, I'm going to fucking click through and make sure that I stop eating that vegetable because I probably don't want to eat it anyway. Yeah, that's a great point. Is, let's, um, is anybody working on something right now that we can apply this to? Like what project are you working on right now where we can say, you know, here's this good thing that's actually already hard for you to do and here's why it's actually bad. Right. Anybody have any, any examples? Well, I, I'm always trying to apply what you guys teach through the lens of working with coaches, you know, so sure. I wrote down, you know, what are people doing to grow a business that they hate doing, you know, and right. how can we kind of turn this into stop doing this thing that you already hate doing because it's making your growth really slow anyway or something. So, right. so yeah. what do people hate doing? In uh, your a lot of things <laughs> jumping um, on sales calls people hate right yeah definitely yeah cold calling that's why uh Networking. travis sago <laughs> crushed it with his homeless sales system to like the whole email uh to to google doc stuff the reason why that was such a compelling offer is because he, he uh like sold people on the idea that you could make more sales by not doing sales calls yeah, and Jason Capital has the anti-selling system right now too. Right. Um, I see all of his ads. <laughs> yep. Like ideally, you want to take the shit that they don't want to do 
and actually make your offer good enough to where they don't have to do those things. Mm -hmm. Like in an ideal world, it's not just the marketing that changes, it's the fucking product design also. Right. But there are ways to find like, okay, maybe you do need sales calls, but maybe you don't. Maybe you get a higher uh, close rate on your sales call if someone else does the sales call instead of you because people are intimidated to, to talk to you. So they're not going to tell you your real problem because you're too much of an authority figure. Is it true? Eh, debatable. But some people are going to be, if they're looking up to this guru and they're on the phone with them, they might have like problems opening up. So if you get other people who are more on their level to take the sales calls, they might give them, uh, be more open about sharing their problems. Yeah, so this is, uh, okay, that's a good question. And Brian will be here too. Is like, because there, there is the problem of obviously you want your product to match with your marketing, but there's a lot of ways to do it. So like, for coaches, you can be like, you know, here's why sales calls are actually killing your coaching business, right? And then what you go into it is you just start talking about, hey, most people, when they hop on the phone, what they're trying to do is they're trying to push something onto somebody and they're stuck in this mindset of, I need to get this, I need to get this, but that's actually hurting your conversions because, you know, people can sense the energy. But if you just approach it from, I'm going to share what I want and I'm going to try to qualify this person to see if they're a right fit for me instead of trying to convince them that I'm a right fit for them, then you're going to close way more deals. So it's not a sale. It's So basically you're, you're still putting them on a sales call, but you're just changing the frame in their in their mind. And that's really all we're doing is just changing the, the, the model that people have. So I like, I literally think you can do this with almost anything, regardless of what the product is. Um, because in that case, it's like, this is just the vehicle to get people into listening to the message. And by the time they're already listening to the message, they have that commitment. Um, you know, as long as you don't lose them and you make a, a compelling argument, you can get them. So like, um, so Olga, you said, uh, clickbank offers like a dental supplement. So what do people hate doing like flossing, right? Probably it's probably the biggest one for, for dental. So, um, you know, you can set up a riddle, like here's, here's Joe Schmo and here's, you know, Mr. Whatever. And, you know, this guy flosses, does this and this, this guy doesn't do any of that, right? What's the difference? You know, but this guy is, has horrible breath and his, you know, something, you know, you can even show a pair of teeth and you'd be like, you know, what's the difference? Um, and then you just can connect it to your, um, to your product. One easy way is going back to this thing here is like, if you're saying what's the difference between these two, um, oops. one is secretly suffering and one is secretly benefiting. So if you follow RMBC, which again, it has like nothing to do with it, like, regardless, this is just the sales, this is just how sales are done, is you're gonna explain the real mechanism, the real reason why they have a problem and the real reason why they have a solution. So there's always that two parts to the mechanism. So if you wanna say, here's why you're secretly suffering, you need to make that your unique mechanism of the problem, right? For example, with Mario's testosterone riddle, the problem was this secret, I forgot what you called it, testosterone killing, yeah. whatever. So you make that the unique mechanism of the problem. And then if you wanna talk about the reason why someone's secretly benefiting, right? You make that the unique mechanism of the solution, which like for the solar ads would be putting a shit ton of solar panels in your house. Um, Stefan said he's got some stuff for dental too. Well, Stefan's iPhone. I do. Yeah. What's up guys. So yeah, with dental, cause I just did a, um, a deep dive on dental and, um, there's a lot of that riddle paradoxical stuff. I think that's one of the reasons why dental actually works so good. I mean, obviously there's basic stuff like why do, you know, a lot of people like brush their teeth, follow all the advice of their dentist, but still get cavities, things like that. Um, but also, you know, if you brush your teeth like too hard, um, it like basically, and too often it destroys the enamel around your teeth, which can then increase cavities, tooth decay, things like that. Listerine mouthwash kills all the germs in your mouth, all the bacteria, which is good and bad bacteria. So you can talk about how mouthwash is actually horrible for your teeth uh, for that reason. Um, I mean, then and just think about like paradoxical stuff. Like I don't know who uses like a water pick or like an aqua flosser. Like I use one and like, my gums like still bleed when I use it. So I'm like, if this thing's supposed to be helping my gums be better. Like, why do my gums keep bleeding? Right. If like flossing so good, why do I see blood? Um, there's just like a lot of 
a lot of stuff there. Also, by the way, fluoride, also too much fluoride. There's a study that it, like um, essentially it leads to tooth staining and it like uh, can actually increase tooth decay. So people who have too much fluoride in their water, stuff like that, have like tooth decay and tooth staining. And then teeth whitening is actually really, really bad for your teeth. It strips the enamel um, and same thing can lead to tooth decay. So sometimes it's about just like, you know, studying the market, but like there's, there's so many things you can do there for things that people like dislike, like they don't like using mouthwash or they, you know, aren't like brushing their teeth as often as they should, or they like, you know, don't like tooth whitening, spending money on tooth whitening products. There's just a lot of things you can do there. I just want to share some thoughts on that. Cool. Yeah, I think we covered a bunch of different examples. So now I'm going to show you another example of something that I decided to write this morning. Just a lead for a bullshit product that doesn't even exist. Just to show like how to put this stuff into actual practice. And I gave myself a 15 minute time limit to do this because I don't want I don't want whether or not this is good or not to depend on like my skill as a writer. I just wanted to show you like the framework itself of coming up of taking what your market wants, what they already believe and what they like flipping their uh, common beliefs on them to create these weird riddles that drive a lot of engagement. So let's walk through that. I wrote this in seven minutes today for a men's dating offer that doesn't exist. Well, unless someone else steals it and try, tries to run with it now. You better just send me royalties and we're good. But yeah, no product off the top of my head. Just showing you what we talked about over the last week or so. So this is Alyssa. She's 24 years old. Obviously smoking hot and what most guys who are being honest would consider wifey material. She recently graduated nursing school. She's loyal, submissive, and family oriented. She hasn't been to a nightclub in years and she doesn't even have social media. Yeah, a dream. Now, was any of this shit realistic? Probably not, but this is what these guys in this market, this is like a dream come true scenario. You get me and Alyssa, everybody's fucking happy, right? Unfortunately, she's also recently engaged because after dating a few guys in the last 24 months, she fell head over heels in love with one of them. So who's the lucky guy? Was it Chad, the trainer she met at her gym after spin class one day who does fitness modeling on the side? Or was it Tyler, the cocky investor who made $8 million during the last crypto boom? What do you think won her over, the looks or the money? So obviously, people in the market have this belief that women love looks or money. And they're probably right. But uh, in the market, this is what they believe. They think that they need looks or money. So they're going to be picking between one of these two guys, right? What's more important? Well, actually, it wasn't either because neither of those guys ever even made it to a second date. And now Alyssa is happily engaged to Danny. He's not a model. He's not a millionaire. Most girls would even consider him below average. But none of that actually matters once they actually meet him because Danny does have one secret advantage that's way more valuable than either looks or money because he discovered a simple conversational loophole that allows him to effortlessly trigger deep primal level attraction in nearly any woman he talks to. The best part is this loophole is so subtle, it never comes across as weird or cringy. So once you understand how it works, you won't ever have to resort to canned lines or insulting women or using other cheap tactics that are likely to get you slapped in public. Because these are a lot of fears that guys have, right? When they're talking, like this is the stuff they don't want to do because they don't want to get called out for doing this weird shit. They just want the girl. So you can use this psychological loophole to effortlessly make all your conversations fun, exciting, and more sexually charged than anything she's ever experienced in her life, which instantly establishes you as the best and only option in her eyes, no matter how many richer or better looking guys are pursuing her. So that's the lead. I don't want to get into no crazy mechanism stuff because I don't want people like Luke running around causing chaos and breaking all these hearts. So we ended it there. And it's not in the mechanism. Like it's, how many, every fucking dating offer has one of these mechanisms, some conversational trick, right? They all have it. There was nothing special about this thing. I could just steal one of the loopholes from any one of their products and still make this lead work. But the point is setting up that curiosity of what they want, like knowing exactly, well, definitely not this guy, knowing what the market wants, people like Alyssa, uh, taking their common beliefs of what they think those girls want, disqualifying those beliefs and then making it something relatable to them that they can actually use to get the girl. So it it, it take it depends on like to make this stuff work, you need to have you have to know the beliefs of your market, the desires of your market, the limitations of your market, and then try to uh, package that together to tie into your direct mechanism. And it's not like the dating off. Like I showed you I stopped 
to I stopped the dating offer because I don't want to get too sleazy on the call. But you can literally apply this to any call. Let's say you're let's say you're doing uh you're selling a guitar training course or something, a guitar training lesson. You can have them listen to two clips, right? First one is some guy that's mediocre. The second guy is rocking out. You have them like really listening closely to the clips and trying to find out what's the difference between the two. Then you tell them that the person who was in the second clip, which was clearly better than the first, the guy that was killing it, has only been playing guitar for three months, but he but he's killing it because of this whatever secret that allows you to learn guitar and become quicker, better, faster than people who uh, practice guitar for years with mediocre results. So you're flipping that common belief that learning guitar and getting good at it requires like all this time. Or what if you're selling teeth whitening? Show two set of teeth. One person eats great foods like grass-fed meats and vegetables, all this healthy shit. The other one is a guy who has an addiction to Swedish fish and Sour Patch Kids. Who's who? Obviously, a healthy guy is going to have better teeth. We're all surprised. That's not the answer. Because just because candy guy takes five seconds out of his day to apply these magical teeth whitening strips that dissolve in 15 minutes with no mess. So despite all his bad habits and doing all the things that the market was told to believe are bad for you and that you have to do, like you can't do and still get results, despite all those things, he's still able to get results because you tie it into your mechanism. And joint pain, like a, a question you could ask here is, why is it that some people who have zero visible cartilage, cartilage left in their knees and are completely bone on bone can run entire, entire marathons with zero physical pain, while other people who have way less wear and tear in their joints struggle just to get out of bed? So now it's like, that flips the idea that people tell you like, oh, you're wear and tear and your cartilage is destroyed. That's why you have pain and can't do these things. Well, obviously that's not the only answer because you have people who have less cartilage than you do, more wear and tear than you. Their MRIs and x-rays are more fucked up than yours, yet they're flying through marathons and like being super active meanwhile you're struggling. So obviously it's going to make you keep uh, watching to find out what's the real reason that's going on. And I think that's the important, uh, that's a lot of important stuff that makes this stuff work. That's why Luke was talking about it before. It's a counterintuitive result that tease a superior solution. So you take already what the market believes to be good and find a way to position that as bad. You take what the market believes to be bad and find a, a way to make it good. And then you take like their common beliefs and their desired outcomes and then to make sure you tie that in to where, to where getting uh, the results they want doesn't require a complete overhaul of their life. It's something that allows them to do the things that they like still make some of the mistakes that they're making and still get results. So the easier, like the, the easier and less work it is to make your uh, vehicle actually deliver results, the better you'll be able to tie it into these riddles. Like, you know, sometimes it's like a little bit of a leap of faith to get your riddles to tie into your mechanism. So that's the one thing you want to look out, look at in your mechanism so that you can tie this in without like having a bunch of people get turned off by it. So that's what I got on that stuff. Hopefully it's helpful. Does it make sense to you guys? And you can literally apply this to like any niche. Like I literally did this, none of this stuff, only started doing this this morning. I wrote the lead in like seven minutes and just started thinking off the top of my head. Obviously, if I spend a couple of hours to study the guitar market, you'll be able, anyone can, anyone spend a couple of hours doing your basic research on the guitar market. You'll find out what they believe to be true, what they like and dislike. And you'll be able to tie it into riddles, showing people that who so you can show examples of people who don't have all the things going for them that they think is required to get results and are still getting great results. Or you could have people who are doing, you can show examples of people who are doing fucked up stuff who thinks who they think that it's stopping them from getting results, but you show examples of people who also have those limitations and things stacked against them getting results as well. So that's what it depends on. It depends on, you have to know, like to make these riddles really work, it has to be, you have to know the pain points of your market. You have to know the common beliefs of your market, of what they already believe to be true. And you need to find out what uh, their objections are, what they are willing to change and aren't willing to change. And then you find your way to tie your mechanism, like based around, the, those are your limitations when you know, like their common beliefs, what their desired uh, the desired outcome, what they're actually willing to change, and you just tie your mechanism around that to where it's something that people don't mind actually doing.
like stop eating vegetables. Like that is going to be a lot greater. That's going to sell a lot better. I don't care how fucking good or bad your copy is. You tell somebody that they're going to lose weight by stop eating one vegetable. That's going to, you can have the best copywriter in the world write you a sales letter about like having to count calories and give up your favorite foods. Anybody can beat you, beat them. If all they have to do is tell them to stop eating one vegetable. So you want to really just stack the deck in your favor and use these like painless vehicles to get results.